front end type development, um, not as much of the back end database kind of stuff. And so I kind of gravitated that direction. Um, and then after about six years with the company, when I left, I was the director of their UI team there. And we had like five guys that we really focused on all the core front end development and design that they did there. Um, and so when I moved back here to Ohio to be closer with family, um, I really wanted to stay sort of close to that role, stick with the front end things. Um, right now I work at Formfire, which is a company, small company in downtown Cleveland um, that builds an online application for insurance brokers. So still kind of related to the healthcare stuff that I was working on uh, when I was a business solver. Um, and with them, I'm their chief um, user interface and user experience designer. Um, and it's been great being back. It's been great being closer to family. Um, and Cleveland, Cleveland's a fun place to be and work. Um, so when I was back in Iowa, uh, I founded g 3 or Studios. And right before I started talking up here, Polly asked me uh, how I came up with the name g 3 or Studios, which it's kind of a weird, nerdy story to admit it. It's not really that great of a story, but um, is anyone here familiar with the game Civilization or Civilization II specifically by Sid Meier? All right, so um, my dad and I both got hooked on this game way back in the day when it came out. And um, he would always choose to play the Aztecs and you get to choose your leader name. So when you, you leave the, the civilization, you choose whatever you want them to refer to you as. And he always picked Dad Azuma which I was jealous of because I really couldn't do anything cool with my name to, to pick another leader of another group. Um, I'm Gordon Edward Hardy III, and actually Gordon Edward Hardy IV is on his way right now. Uh, my wife's expecting like any day now, so that's crazy. Um, but I would play as the Romans, and so I decided to choose the name G3zer, kind of referring to Caesar, obviously, the Romans. Um, and that, that name kind of just stuck as what I could use as a company name when I found a G3zer Studios. Um, I'm also part of another LLC that's Lamestream Games. Um, and that's an interesting group. It's a group of four people. Um, it's myself, Alex, one of my good friends that I had met back in Iowa. Um, another friend, Chris Griffith, who I refer to as Griff. Uh, and he lives in, in Colorado right now. And then another friend, Max Ulichny, who is a fellow graduate of Hudson High School, and now lives out in Los Angeles and works for a visual effects shop out there. So. It was kind of, it's a great team, it's great guys to work with, but it was really crazy working with people that are spread you know, all over the country and trying to orchestrate when we're gonna meet, when we're gonna work on things, all being in completely separate time zones. Uh, so we'll talk about a little bit of those challenges later on. Um, I also love to draw, and I've loved to draw for ever that I can remember. Um, it's been a way for me to relax and kind of shut off my brain from the things, you know, the programming type things that I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and kind of freeing to just, you know, focus on something a little bit more creative and get, get out of my own head for a while. Um, and so, you know, I've always messed around and dabbled with some things. These are some other pieces of art that I've done. There's, um, there's a, an account on Twitter that's called Sketch Dailies, and they have themes that they shoot out there every day. So if any of you people like to sketch or anything like that, I highly recommend following them and then just kind of jumping on any of these topics that they throw out and you find interesting. I really just enjoy kind of messing around and, and drawing some ideas for some of that stuff. So it may or may not come as a surprise to you that with my computer science background in programming and my love of art, that I kind of wanted to merge the two together and I really got interested in game design and application uh, apps and app design. And this was right when the iPhone and the iPod Touch first came out. I, I knew I wanted to do something with this platform. It just seemed too cool to ignore. Um, and so my wife got me my first um, iPod Touch as a Christmas gift, like the first year they were out. And uh, I started messing around with things, which spawned into way down the road, releasing uh, my first app, my first game, which is Block Blasters. So this, is, uh, this was released under G3s or Studios. And myself and my friend Alex, that I knew from Iowa, um, decided we wanted to build a game together. And we were trying to come up with ideas of uh, you know, what we could do, what sort of mechanics we could incorporate, what we even wanted the game to be about. We both really enjoyed puzzle games. Um, and we came up with this idea that it'd be really cool if you had like blocks and you could touch the screen to, to blast them out of this key, you know, this space on the screen. And that's where you see the green lines. You try to knock these evil red blocks out of those spaces. There's a bunch of other kinds of blocks that are made of all, or all sorts of different materials and things like that. Um, there's also green blocks that show up later in the game that you need to try to keep inside those lines while you're getting the red ones out of there. Um, so it gets kind of crazy. And there's a bunch of levels. There's 
three different worlds that we built for this. And um, you know, going into it, we were both very excited about it. And, and we're kind of getting into development and like building all these different game assets and these files. And it was really exciting. And we got to a point where it was like, OK, now we somehow have to come up with like all these different levels for everything and somehow try to make them more difficult as people progress. And it got to be much more of a grind than I anticipated. That's one of the things I really learned going through all of this. Um, but we kind of powered through, and then, and then we got towards the end of the project, and we were just like, you know, we just got to get this done. So for the last month or so of the project, um, we really hunkered down and, and really tried to do as much as possible in a short amount of time, get all of our testing in and get this thing released. So at the end of it all, it took us about six months to build this thing. It was like this huge labor of love. We were both very excited to do it, um, but it was just way, way more intense than either one of us anticipated. Um, and so we released it in December of 2012, and it did okay. I mean, we made like pizza money off of it, nothing crazy. You know, going into it, we had no idea what to expect. We were really trying our best to make the best thing we could, and always had these crazy dreams of being on, you know, the front page of the App Store, like every developer does. It completely taking off, and that didn't happen. Um, so if that, if you consider Block Blaster as kind of one end of the spectrum where we really poured like a lot of time and energy into this thing, then the opposite end of the spectrum would be Furious Eagles. And this is an app that my friend Griff and I made in literally about a weekend. And um, it's, it's really, I don't know, it's kind of embarrassing even to, to show it and to talk about it because we really didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. The, co the concept is really simple. You just kind of tap to fly. You, you run out of fuel over there on the right-hand side, and you need to eat birds that look like angry birds to, to gain more fuel and avoid obstacles. Um, this ended up doing way better than Block Blasters ever did, which totally blew my mind. And it was a little infuriating that we, we spent so little time on something that was kind of a joke, really. It was more of a dig at angry birds and how silly and simple that was um, versus some of the other puzzle games that I really like to play that you make you think a little bit more. Um, so. I, this ended up doing really well. We, we had ads in this game. It wasn't a paid game. Block Blasters was a dollar. Um, and uh, this, this one ended up kind of taking off and doing pretty well in the Android store. Um, so I also have some other projects that I've worked on in the meantime. Um, this is a time lapse video kind of showing a day-night cycle of another project I was working on for a while. And this, this game was called Ding Dong High. Um, and, and that's after uh, a game that my daughter uh, who's four now, was two at the time. She loved to play this game with her dollhouse where she would have her little people walk up to the door, she would press the doorbell, it would ding dong, and then you'd have to open the door and she'd say hi and move the, the toys inside the house. And she just like do that over and over and over again. And so kind of got this idea uh, for a game sort of related to that where you'd tap on the door, you'd hear the doorbell, a friendly little creature would come out at you, and you'd have to pick the right thing to give them, whether it's you know a banana or a dog bone or a leaf or whatever. Um, this is another uh, project that we worked on. This was actually, this is a work in progress um, video from the project that I worked on with Lamestream Games. So this is the group of four of us that worked on this together. And Max uh, did all the visual assets for this. We really thought that we had a killer team, you know, with, with three people who were reasonably, reasonably competent on the programming side and one guy who is pretty fantastic at artwork. Um, and, and this kind of faltered as we were working on it. Um, the whole goal with this is you kind of blast upward, you try and connect, c collect bananas uh, for points. Again, there's like a fuel meter over there on the right hand side and there's little fuel pickups that you can pick up as you're going higher and higher. Um, there's some obstacles to avoid and there's dotted lines that you need to stay inside of the dotted lines. Um, this, this project was a fun one because I really enjoyed working with those guys, but it was, it was interesting how difficult it was to just get everyone together at the same time, to all be able to have the same conversations, um, to be able to update the same code set and, and have not, people not like tripping over each other and messing up with each other's changes and things like that. Um, you can see he's about to explode here. Um, and uh, it was really difficult too to, to even land on our idea of what we wanted to build in the first place. I mean, we probably talked for a couple months before we really realized exactly what game we wanted to build, whereas Alex and I had sat down in like an afternoon and just kicked around some ideas and landed on something. So um, there were some things that I didn't expect with the project. Um, it was still a lot of fun to work on, though. 
Um, and then here's the last one I want to share with you guys. This is another one that I've been working on um, recently. It's sort of like a tower defense um, strategy sort of game. Um, and you can build up those towers at the bottom that shoot at like waves of enemies that are coming down the screen at you in ever increasing levels of difficulty. Um, and you can either upgrade those towers or purchase different sorts of towers um, down there. So, so why get into game and app development? Um, there's probably lots of reasons for this. One is um, mobile gaming is on the rise. I mean, it's when you look across the board at different um, different sets of hardware. The blue at the top there is console. PC is in the green. That's always been popular for gaming. Um, at the bottom there, though, we're seeing that purple, which is smart smartphones, and uh, the blue at the very bottom is tablets. That is totally on the rise. It's already outpacing um, console sales for games. Uh, it's pretty incredible. People always have their devices with them, um, and, and they're really getting hooked on all kinds of different games. So it's, it's, a, it's a crazy cool market. On the app side of things, too, people are getting more used to buying things online. Um, so here's a graph we're showing. This is um, game sales in retail brick and mortar stores in the blue. And that like orangey rust color is um, online video game sales. And you can see the market has already overtaken brick and mortar stores for video game sales. The holiday season had been um, a long time holdout for the retail stores that, you know, over the course of the year, online would crush them. And then come Christmas time, I don't know if it was grandmas or what, but everyone would go to the brick and mortar stores and buy those video games as gifts or whatever for people. 2014 was actually the first year in which online sales of video games beat the brick and mortar um, sales of video games during that holiday season. So that's kind of a crazy milestone for that too. Um, and obviously there's money to be made there. <laughs> there's uh, 29.4 billion um, in smartphone app sales. And the same thing for, for tablets. And tablets is only gonna be on the rise even more. So those get more and more popular with people. And obviously fun, right? Like I love fun. People play games for fun. People also design and develop games for fun. Same thing with apps. Um, it's really cool to have a game and, and say, you know, I really like this game, but I wish you know, I could run faster. I wish I could shoot further. I wish I could drive uh, this car or drive faster, whatever, um, and be able to do that. And when you're building your own game, you have control over that. If you have an idea for something that you, you said, I really wish there were an app for this. I wish there's an app that did that. When you're designing and developing your own app, you have complete control over that. So that's really cool too. And the whole process of learning too. There's so much, so much <laughs> going into this that I didn't even realize that I would have to account for, figure out, handle, and learn. And the process of learning all these different areas where I had just been focused in programming and you know art for fun, it was really cool to be able to look into these different areas, really explore them, and learn a lot about them. So that's what I'd like to go through tonight is some of these things and share some of these uh, things that I've learned and some takeaways that you guys probably, hopefully, won't have to learn on your own. <laughs> all right, so platform. Probably your first choice that you have when you've decided you want to make a mobile app or a mobile game is what sort of platform are you targeting? Um, and there's a lot of factors that go into this. It's not like it's a really easy choice all the time. Um, so obviously, if you're looking for some kind of like an action game or something like that, uh, you can consider the consoles. If you're making some kind of a tax software or something, you're probably not going to want to release that for Xbox. So some of that's going to be a little uh, intuitive on its own. But thinking of the genre, certain genres work better on different platforms. Um, casual games are great on mobile devices. Games where you have a really simple mechanic where it's just a simple, single tap is really great. But if I have a game where you know, I need to control a player moving around and shooting different weapons and things like that, and I really need more of like a, a console controller for that, that's going to be a harder sell on a mobile device. So that's the mechanic. The mechanics of the game also uh, come into that quite a bit. Testability. Um, so even if we wanted to release Block Blasters on BlackBerry, it would have been a horrible idea for us because I don't even know anybody who owns a BlackBerry. So being able to test it would have been nearly impossible. Um, once it's out there in the wild, if people are having issues with your app or with your game, you really want to be able to have like a device that you can go to and recreate those issues so that you can make sure that you fix them in your code when you release an update for them. So testability is kind of a huge factor to consider. I wouldn't release a game for Xbox, for example, because I don't have an Xbox. It'd be tough to test. Um, 
exposure and reach. So each of these other um, platforms have their own audience, have their own markets. And those markets are different sizes. And we'll talk about a little bit about those tonight. Um, but you're going to want to consider that. You're going to want to release whatever you're building uh, for the largest possible market. And ideally, you're going to want to find out who your target audience is. It's going to be some subset of people. Um, but you're, you're not going to want to let that limit you. You're going to want to have your platform help you in that regard so that you can target those people on every single platform that they may want to use your app or your game. And then lastly, you probably want to consider revenue too. Um, you're not going to want to sell something on a platform that doesn't historically do well revenue-wise. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here too. Mobile platforms. So there's kind of two big ones. Um, out of curiosity, who here uses an iPhone as their primary phone? All right, what about Androids? Okay, about it's like half and half, maybe a little less for Androids. I just like to know that so I know which one I can make fun of and which one I can't make fun of. Um, I'll probably hold off on the jokes then. Um, each of these has their own marketplace. When things first started out, Apple had the App Store, Android had their, their own Google Play. It wasn't branded that at the time, but it is now. Um, since then, Amazon has introduced their own app store um, for Android apps. The idea being that they will curate the list of apps that are accepted at their store. So if people are looking for higher quality apps or games, they can go to the Android marketplace and know that those have been specifically approved as a higher level of quality. Um, we release Block Blasters on all of these. Um, and I really haven't seen like very strong sales through the Amazon marketplace. Um, I don't use an Android device regularly. I assume that the people that do probably don't make high, heavy use of the Amazon marketplace. It might only be for like Kindle and Nook people and stuff like that. Um, so another thing to think about when you're, when you're considering platform is actually registering to be a developer. And you have two choices when you register to be a developer. You can either register as an individual or you can register as a corporation. And in the App Store, the Apple App Store, the main difference between these two is that if you register as an individual, you're presenting yourself as your own person who has the, their own Apple account. It's your name that shows up as the developer, not your company name. And it's your email address that gets tied in uh, as a contact method for anyone who wants to contact you about stuff. So when, I, when we decided we wanted to make Block Blasters, I kind of had it in my head that there were games I wanted to make down the road. And I wanted to build a company to, to um, register with Apple as a company instead of as an individual. So that's kind of the path that I went down. Now, when I went to Google to register, um, it was $25 for the developer fee, which is nice compared to the 99 that it is for an Apple developer. Um, and their registration process is super easy. It probably took me like five minutes max, maybe, to go out. At this point, I had already filed with the state of Iowa for my LLC for g 3 zer I had already gone to the government and gotten my EIN. I went to Google. I gave them my info, um, hooked it up with a bank account, and away I went. It was really, really, really very simple. Same thing for Amazon. When I went out to their site um, and I set up my developer account on their site, it was also very easy to go through their process. Um, they have an app review process, which uh, Android does, I mean, they, they kind of automate there. So the, the Google one is a lot faster. Your releases will get approved a lot faster. Um, with Amazon, I had to wait a little bit once I released the app for them to actually approve it, the same as the App Store does. But again, it wasn't a huge deal. Um, and registration was super simple. It was pretty nice. Uh, Apple, on the other hand, was kind of a nightmare. <laughs> so if you're registering with Apple as an individual, um, it's, uh, it's probably pretty painless. I would imagine it's very painless. However, if you're registering with Apple as a, a company of any sort, um, they ask you to provide a DUNS number, right? So I'm filling out my application, going through everything's peach keen, and I get to the part where they're asking me for a DUNS number. What the heck is a DUNS number? This is the first I've ever heard of this thing. <laughs> Apparently, it is a thing, um, and lots of companies use it. Uh, it's used a lot for doing credit checks against companies, so that if you're, if you're going to be investing in someone and you kind of want to know what their track record is, you can contact Dun and Bradstreet, give them this number, pay them a bunch of money, and they'll give you like a credit report for the company. Now, as an app developer, that's pretty useless to me because I'm not going to be looking for a bunch of investment money or taking out loans or anything like that from people. Uh, so it was really more of like a stumbling block than anything that I had to deal with. 
So anyway, I went up to Dunn and Bradstreet, begrudgingly, requested my Dunn's number. Um, conveniently, they have a way to expedite the process, which normally takes about a month. Um, you have to pay $300, and then you can get it in like a week. And being like just a guy doing development on the side, I didn't really want to cough up that kind of coin. So I was like, whatever, I'll wait, it's fine. Um, I waited a month, still nothing. Waited another week or two, still nothing. I came back to Dun and Bradstreet to check the status of my number, and lo and behold, there it was. They had already generated my number. Um, but it hadn't synced with my Apple developer account yet. When I went to Apple to complete my registration, it said that it couldn't find it. Um, and apparently Apple only pulled from Dun and Bradstreet like every 14 days or so. So by the time everything was all done, it had taken me 61 days to complete the Apple developer registration process, which seemed completely insane to me, um, especially since the holdup was this number that I didn't even really care to have in the first place. Um, so if you guys are doing that, I would recommend that you start that at the beginning when you're first working on your app, uh, instead of waiting until you're done. Because if you want to release your app or your game to everybody all at once, It'd be really frustrating to have to wait and wait and wait and wait longer just for this one simple thing to go through um, so that you can make that happen. All right, and then this is just a chart that's kind of a breakdown of uh, payment to developers. And it may or may not be a surprise to people that um, the App Store, people pay more uh, for apps on the App Store than they do on Android devices. Um, so they, they pay out more to developers. When you look at total downloads and app revenue, downloads are pretty much even, kind of even, close enough anyway. Um, and app revenue, again, the App Store seems to be killing it over Google Play. Um, developers are making more money uh, per app download in the App Store than they are um, off of their Android apps. So I'm not saying that this means that you should only develop for iOS, but I would say that if you're developing an application, you probably want to at least consider iOS. It's really tough to ignore it when you look at numbers like these. Lots of people um, develop apps for both Android and iOS. Um, I would say that it would probably, probably be wise to do that rather than just focusing on um, Android. Um, desktop marketplaces for games. So there's a few of these out there. The big one is Steam. Um, most people have probably heard of Steam. They used to just have games. Now they actually sell software there. It's a huge online store um, where people, people buy all kinds of things. Um, Desura is kind of like the minor league team to Steam, so like the farm team, I guess you could think of it as, where uh, if, if, you are, if your app is accepted to Desura and it performs well, Steam would take notice and they would wrap it into their store. Um, since that was kind of the model when I had started Block Blasters, it has now changed, and Steam has what they call the green light program in which you can submit your apps to Steam. And if people look at them and like them and give them enough votes, they can actually get bumped up and approved by Steam that way. You don't have to come through this, this other store to do that. Um, and lastly is Indie City. Um, and Indie City is really super indie friendly. They don't really discriminate or anything like that. There's, there's really no like review process or anything. Um, their audience obviously isn't nearly as large as Steam's is. Um, but it, you can release pretty much anything through Indie City. Um, and you have a good audience there. It's, it's pretty good, and people obviously know what they're getting into with it. They know that it's indie, independent titles, um, and, and they're pretty good about engaging and giving feedback and stuff like that. So monetization, probably another thing you're going to want to think about. Um, and there, you have some choices here, right? So when the App Store was first announced um, and the iPhone kind of came out and smartphones started to take hold, there are really only two options for developers, and that's either you're going to charge for your app or you're not going to charge for your app. It's going to be a free app. Um, and the price point seemed to be 99 cents. For the most part, it's kind of stuck around that. I think people have increased uh, a bit from there. You see stuff for you know $2 or $5 um, every now and then. But it's probably right around the $1 or $2 mark. Um, then ad companies started to get wise and said, hey, we can make some money if uh, if we sell ads in these games, in these apps. And so app developers thought this was a great way of offsetting that $99 cost for an Apple license. If I can just throw some ads in my game that people didn't pay for, um, I can make some extra money. And that's actually the model that Furious Eagles used, and uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, then there's this concept of paying to upgrade. So um, Apple announced in-app purchases 
and uh, Google has the same thing. I'm not sure who came first with that one. Um, but the idea is that you can get an app for free or you pay for the app, but there's, you have the ability to make a purchase when you're in the app. And so a lot of people used this as an opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to sell my app. I'm going to put ads in it. If they want to turn off the ads, I'm going to let them pay a dollar amount. Um, this is cool. The only thing you're going to want to consider with this is what is the average lifetime value that you're making off of somebody who is strictly having to deal with the ads? Are they clicking enough and are you making enough off of them that you can justify the cost that you're offering them to buy the app for? So if you're only charging them a dollar you know, to, to remove the ads, you're going to want to make sure that you wouldn't have made more than a dollar if you had just left the ads in there in the first place. Um, and so then along with this is the, the freemium model, the idea that the app is free and then there's in-app purchases for upgrades to the app. Um, another thing that kind of got popular for a while and then really fizzled away um, is this idea that you, you purchase, you download a game for free, you get 12 levels or whatever, you like it, you have an in-app purchase to purchase the other you know, 36 or whatever. And we actually considered this with Block Blasters because we thought it would be uh, a really good opportunity for that. You get the first world, you know, maybe there's like 12 or 24 levels in there. Um, but it turns out <laughs> that it is to just uninstall the app and go find another free game than it is to actually go ahead and make that purchase. So um, people end up doing that. It's kind of a bad idea to, to really hold that content from your game with a paywall like that because there's a high risk of scaring people away. Um, there are, however, in-app purchases that are done uh, the more intelligently. There's lots of ones that will save you time when you're playing a game. So uh, those seem to be more successful than having some sort of a paywall that actually prevents you from doing something and scaring someone into another game. Here's a chart um, from my friend uh, Griff um, from one of his other apps that he, he's worked on, um, AOTFB, which stands for Attack of the Fanboys. Um, he, this is an allusion to Apple fanboys. He's more of an Android guy, and he made a game, it's a zombie game, where the zombies are Apple fanboys. Um, and so this is a breakdown of his ad revenue over like a three year period. Um, and really the, the, the interesting thing that I, we can see here um, is that he's graphed this out and then he's graphed a, a 30 day rolling average of how much he's made from his ads. The really surprising thing is like, you can see during the holidays it peaks a little bit, but there's another peak in there for back to school. And that's something that I didn't even anticipate that app sales actually in ads um, will increase over the back to school period where people are getting new phones, they're going back to school, they're not at home where their parents can tell them to stop playing games. Uh, I don't know. But uh, that was a little bump that I hadn't, hadn't expected. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, so the other question is, I, all right, I'm going to put ads in my game. Do people actually click those things? Like, I don't think I've ever clicked an ad in the game unless it was a mistake. Uh, apparently, people do. 5% five, um, five or 10% or between there, people click ads. And maybe only 5% uh, or 10% of people are making mistakes, but that's still mistakes that'll earn you revenue. Um, and again, here, you can kind of see little peaks, too, around the holiday area and around the back-to-school season, too. Free apps with in-app purchases are crushing it right now. They're doing really well. Um, there is really low barrier to entry for um, someone to pick one of these up and start using it and see if they like it. People love the fact that it's free and they can try it out before they have any kind of monetary commitment to the app itself. Um, and so they're doing really well. Uh, the revenue is you know, 71% right there. Um, paid apps is still hanging on. Paid apps are still pretty popular um, at, at a quarter. And then you've got people for whatever reason that have, you know, paid apps with in-app purchases, which doesn't surprise me that those wouldn't do very well. It seems like they're probably just full of reviews of people that are grumpy that they bought an app and now have to pay for even more functionality <laughs> than they already coughed up some money up front. Uh, or are they not crushing it? Because this graph tells a little bit of a different story. This is like the average dollar amount that you will make off of an app that is either paid only, paid with in-app purchases, or free with in-app purchases. And free with in-app purchases is hovering around a dollar where if it's a paid app, the average paid app and the average paid app with an in-app purchase is making about two bucks. Now, this is kind of a little misleading, I think, because the majority of downloads are going to be free with in-app purchases. So even though you're only going to make maybe a dollar off of each of those, 
if you can get 8,000 people to download that, and I'll make about a, a dollar on average, that's gonna be way better than the 80 people that are gonna download your paid only app at $2. Um, and this is something that we saw when we released Block Blasters. I've got a slide like further down here where I talk about this. Um, but maybe like a month or two into it, we decided to make Block Blasters free for a weekend to see if that would spur any growth. Um, and until then we had well, maybe like 70 or 100 downloads. Uh, of the paid version. Um, and then that one weekend that we released it for free for just Saturday and Sunday, we had 8,000 downloads of the application, which just blew my mind. It was like, how, how did people even know that we had changed the price point? Um, I know there's apps out there that'll track that and call those things to your attention if something goes on sale or whatever, but that people would notice it and take interest just blew my mind. I wasn't expecting that at all. I expected a little bit of a bump, but to have 8,000 downloads, it was, it was kind of nuts. It was, no, <laughs> we, so we face this thing where when you release an app, you're going to get a lot of attention early on. Um, and then it kind of fizzles and fades down. And we waited till it rode down in the trough a little bit. And then um, we just said, you know what, let's see if we can get more people in here and hooked on it. And maybe we had some social sharing stuff in with the app too. So hopefully the more people in there, people will talk to their friends about it and their friends will go check it out and be like, ah, I got to pay for it. Oh, well. <laughs> um, and it, we might've gotten a little bump after that, uh, but nothing substantial. Um, it just kind of blew my mind that, it, that that many people downloaded it in one weekend. Um, so development tools. Um, if you're building um, an iOS app, you've got some options for native tools, right? So these are the ones that, you know, Apple have provides Xcode, um, Google provides the Android development toolkit, and um, if you're building a Windows phone app or a Windows app or anything like that, you're going to be using Visual Studio. Um, now, way back in the day, and still today, I guess, but um, most of the development for um, iOS was done via Xcode and Objective-C. And so when I first got my iPod Touch and I knew I wanted to do some kind of development, um, I started learning Objective-C, as most developers did, because that's what they wanted to do. Uh, well, since then, Apple has released uh, Swift, which is a much cleaner and more uh, concise way of developing for iOS. Um, you don't have to worry about things like bit blitting and memory management, all kinds of junk like that. You can focus more time on actually building in the functionality that you want to have in your app. Um, so they've definitely made that tool a lot more appealing to developers. Um, the Java Development Toolkit is actually pretty strong. It sits on top of Eclipse and it's got a bunch of emulators built into it so you can emulate different devices on your, on your machine um, and, and test there. In Xcode, or I'm sorry, Visual Studio, again, kind of the standard um, development environment for any sort of Windows stuff. But the, the killer part here is that if you want to be designing and building an app for multiple platforms, um, you're faced with the daunting task of learning the Xcode environment, which isn't really user friendly, um, Objective C, potentially Swift. And then if you want to release for, for Android, you're going to have to learn Java development. And Visual Studio, you're looking at C Sharp. And while some of those are kind of similar to one another, um, that's, that's a monumental task. You're almost better off having three separate developers working on each of those three things. Um, and so that's when we really get into uh, this concept of cross-platform, um, where you can essentially design it and build it in one tool and automatically deploy it to all kinds of different um, platforms. Fantastic. At first, Apple wouldn't even support this. Apple refused to even allow this. If you were building an iOS app, you had to use Xcode. They wanted you to use their tool and use their language where you have the utmost control over everything. Um, but they wouldn't even allow these third parties to come in here and build for their platform. It wasn't long, though, before they decided to do away with that rule. And it opened the door for um, other tools, much like Unity, uh, which is the tool, my tool of choice. Um, it builds for all kinds of platforms. Um, there's a free version and there's also a pro version. Um, the pro is kind of expensive for my tastes, but for free, um, you've got some pretty good, pretty good options in that, in that side of the tool. Unless you're a real serious game studio, you can probably get by with the free version. Um, so here's, this is some highlight reels of um, other games that were built with the Unity environment. And so you'll notice it's, it's a really robust tool. Um, you can do a whole lot with it. It does 3D really well. 
Um, but that's not to say that you can't build 2D games um, with Unity. Uh, Block Blasters was built in Unity, and most all the other highlights actually that I showed you of other games um, were also built with Unity. The downside is that if you are building a 2D game, you kind of have that overhead of the 3D engine that's running behind the scenes. Um, it's really meant for you know doing this kind of stuff um, as opposed to more simple 2D animations and moving sprites around and, and things like that. So there's a bit of overhead that you kind of bring along with you. Another option for you would be Corona, the Corona SDK. Um, and this is a good one if you are building a 2D game, not a 3D game. I don't think Corona does 3D at this point. Um, you're kind of limited on where you can release this. So um, I'm not sure they support Windows or Linux or uh, Mac OS X or anything like that yet. Um, but it's really simple. It's based on the Lua programming language, um, which is kind of similar to Python. And if you're not really a developer, it might be uh, a good place to start because it's, it's probably easier to pick up than, say, um, JavaScript or C Sharp, which are the two languages that you have to use if you're going to write an application or a game in Unity. Um, so here's some, some examples of uh, titles that were created with Corona. You can see that, I mean, they're obviously two-dimensional things, um, but it has a lot of neat features built in um, for animations and transitions and things like that. Um, so it's, it's really friendly for that kind of stuff. Now, if you're building an application and not a game at all, um, Titanium's Appcelerator is a great option for that. Um, again, this is going to let you develop once and build across multiple platforms. Um, the, the core language for this one is actually HTML and JavaScript. Uh, it's a derivative of HTML anyway, it's just another markup language. And um, any web developer is probably going to be able to pick this up fairly quickly and run with it because you can use that templating language for all your layout that you want to do. Um, and JavaScript is pretty universal um, for web developers for introducing any kind of interactivity into the application. Um, and Titanium is great for building um, applications that kind of mimic the native UI. So if, you, if you're familiar with on an iPhone how the drop-down menus look and all that stuff, it's really easy and quick to build that up and have it look exactly like it does on the phone. Um, if you want to do anything custom and have like your own look and feel, you might be better off um, with something like Corona or one of the other 2D engines that's out there. Um, you can kind of do it with AppCelerator, but its strength is really its ability to create native UI appearing applications relatively easily. Um, Cocos 2D is another one. This one's been around for quite a while. Um, and this, um, this is uh, another good option for um, 2D app development, game development. Uh, it doesn't really have the niceties if you're doing an app like you'd have an AppCelerator. Um, and it wouldn't have the 3D stuff that Unity has, um, but it would be another good option to check into. I've also heard very good things about Game Salad from some people. Um, there's a guy uh, that works in downtown Cleveland that I ran into um, who develops um, in Game Salad. He works at, uh, at Lean Dog, and he's also a stand-up comedian, which is kind of crazy. Um, but he's, he's not really well versed in the programming aspect of things. His strength is more in like the design and uh, um, the, the vision kind of of how he wants things built. And he's really enjoyed working with Game Salad. I don't personally have any experience with it, but I've heard good things. Okay, so source code management. I don't, I'm not going to talk about this very long, um, other than, than to say that it's probably a good idea. <laughs> uh, so when, when you're working on this and you have a project that you've been working on for, say, I don't know, six months or so, uh, you really don't want to be in the position where if, if something gets corrupted, if you make a change and it screws everything up, then you've lost you know, weeks or months worth of work on things. So it's a really great idea to incorporate um, something like CVS or Git or Subversion. Any kind of development environment that you're using, which essentially uses the file system to store the files that you're editing, the images and the code and whatnot, is going to play well with any of these. Um, Unity has their own source code management stuff in their pro version, but you have to pay an additional subscription fee, I believe, uh, to use that. When we were working mainstream games, we used um, Unity with Subversion um, to do our code management. And we were just using the free version of Unity. There were some hiccups with binary files, and if people were working on the same kind of areas at the same time, it was still a little, there was still some friction there, um, but it was worlds better than if we didn't have anything like this. So 
Another thing is uh, very simply, if you want to start really simply and not really mess with any of these, you can use what I refer to as um, GVS, which is the Griffith versioning system. And this is what my friend uh, Chris Griffith practices. Uh, so he, he takes, before he's ready to make a big change to his game or his application, he grabs that directory, throws it somewhere else, and puts the date on the end of it. So that way, if he screws up his change, he can always go back to the old copy. Um, and last night I told him I was going to make fun of him tonight and, and mention his versioning system. And he's informed me that he now has GVS 2.0, where instead of doing that, he just right clicks on the directory and says, compress this directory. It creates a zip file and then auto appends a number to the end of it every time he does that. So now, he's, now he has a compressed copy of his code instead of a, a separate file as a duplicate copy of everything. All right, so assets. Um, one of the things we realized getting into development with Block Blasters relatively early on that we didn't really anticipate to the level that we experienced it was that it requires a crazy amount of assets to actually build a game. When you think about it and you break things down, you've got your sprites, your image files, you've got background music that you've got to find, sound effects, um, all the animations that go into it, particle effects. There's just so much stuff that ends up needing to get built to make a, the simple first scene in your game even. Um, so it becomes overwhelming if you're on a small team of people trying to build a game or build a, an image heavy or, or media heavy app that you're faced with this challenge of creating all of these assets. Uh, fortunately, there's help, right? So Unity has uh, what they call the asset store. Um, and I started using Unity before this existed. Uh, and through when they built it up, it, it was just amazing when they first introduced this thing. Developers would go out there and, and say they worked on an app or a game for something. Um, they would go ahead and sell some of their assets on the store. Um, as Unity gained popularity, more people were attracted to the platform. There was much more of a market for these sorts of assets to be built. More people went and sold them in the store. Right? People who used to be game developers probably realized they could make just as much, if not more, money by just building the assets and releasing those for anyone who's interested in using them in their games. And so you can find things like sound files, um, music, uh, character meshes, animations. There's full projects out here. There's code to do different things like pathfinding and stuff like that. It's pretty incredible all the different categories they have here. Not everything is paid either, so you can find some pretty good free assets. And if you just kind of want to play around and, and mess around with Unity, it's a good place to really start and find some free things to use um, and maybe make some crazy games where like the main character is a free tree or something like that. Um, the other thing to note with this is that you don't have to be using Unity to make use of these assets. You can find packages out here that are basically just the sound files, just the image files, things like that. And those are going to work in pretty much any platform that you're using. Another good option is paid freelance. So if you, need, if you have a specific vision that you really need built out and you can't do it yourself, um, there's plenty of places you can go online to find people to help out with that kind of stuff. Other, you might have personal connections that'll help with that too. Fiverr is a great place. Um, you can get some pretty quality stuff there for five or 15 bucks, something like that, um, from artists. And the other nice thing about Fiverr and online places or that oftentimes they'll have examples of that person's work before you're actually hiring them to do your project. So you can kind of make sure that their look and feel is in line and the quality of their work is up to the par that you want to have. Um, another good choice is students. So um, students, whether they're high school or college, could be a great opportunity for them you know, to get their work featured in an app or featured in a game. They can put it in their portfolio. When they're going to get hired, they can have these conversations and mention the fact that they, you know, they built some of these assets for stuff. So that's a, that's a great option, too. You can throw them some pizza money or some beer money. They love that, too. Um, and lastly, uh, the internet. Wouldn't want to disappoint Al Gore and not mention this one. Uh, but the internet has some great resources, too. If you're looking for photos, for example, so maybe you need some photos for an app, um, Flickr is actually a great place to go for that. Now, you want to be careful, though, because not all of the photos on Flickr are going to be um, free to use. But they do have this nice feature in their search, where if you do an advanced search, you can limit to just Creative Commons images. And then you can also limit to um, different licenses for images. 
So for example, you can say, show me only images that um, have been approved for use in an app as long as I give the artist attribution. So you can have a credits page in your app that lists that artist's name and still have free use of any of their artwork that they're releasing um, on Flickr inside of your app. Um, open game art is another great place to go if you're looking for um, tile maps or sprites or um, things like that. That's all going to be open and free to use as part of the um, open source community. And then again, Google. Um, Google Images recently made an update too where you can, you can filter by license type. So you can do a Google Images search and show only images that have been approved for commercial use with an attribution license or free use with an attribution license. Um, if you want to make changes to them, you're going to want to make sure that the license allows for that too because there's a different um, license type that has to approve modifications to the image. Uh, so you're going to want to be careful what you pick and not get yourself into a hole. Um, but it's all listed out when you go to those sites. And they have some really quality things if you do some digging. Um, if you're looking for game music, I found a great source for music to be Vimeo's Video Enhancer, which is kind of a weird thing. <laughs> um, if you post a video on Vimeo, they give you the option of enhancing it with filter effects and, and music that you lay over on top of it and stuff like that. Um, if you go out to their enhancer, though, you can just search this and find it without having to um, upload a, vid a video to Vimeo. You can find their enhancer and just browse all of the different music that they have broken down by genre. Um, and you can search, do keyword searches on the music if you're looking for a specific feel or something like that. There's a lot of good free options in their music. There's paid and free. Um, but I found this to be a fantastic resource when I'm looking for not only game assets, but when I start you know, pushing out some marketing things like trailers and whatnot. Um, great for background music for that stuff too. Um, freemusicarchive.org, also another great place for music. Uh, there's a lot of Creative Commons content out there for music um, and stuff that's licensed for free use with attribution out there as well. For sound clips, the, my top two that I really like to go to are freesound.org and soundbible.org. Um, again, I think these are either Creative Commons or um, open source ones. Uh, but they, they've got great content, and you can pretty much find any sound effect you're looking for, um, or one to create your own sound effect from any of those two. So analytics. Um, analytics is extremely important, I think, in app and game development. And there's a few reasons for this that uh, we'll get into later when we talk about feedback. Uh, but uh, the, the big player, obviously, is Google Analytics. You know, they're kind of the de facto standard in the industry for collecting and displaying this stuff. But there are some app and game specific ones that are probably good options also. Um, Flurry was probably one of the early ones that's been out there for a while. They're pretty easy to integrate um, with your app. And their analytics, wow, Google Analytics is great and all. You kind of have to like, set it up in the way that it's not really intended to be set up so that you can use it with your, with your game or with your app. Uh, they're really more designed towards website analytics, but you can, you can still make it work. We did. Um, Flurry is more geared towards specific to application and um, game development. Uh, game analytics is another good one. And recently, Unity has announced that they have their own package for this also called Unity Analytics. Um, I was fortunate enough to be invited to be a beta tester for Unity Analytics, and it's pretty strong. Uh, it did all of the things that we were using Google Analytics to do, and it also had the added value of being able to pull that analytics information into the Unity IDE so that as you're building your game, you can see heat maps of, like, you know, a player made it this far, um, and, and really use the data where you want it, like in the application when you're building your game. So what do you want to track with analytics? Um, there's some really key things here. Game and app starts, kind of a no-brainer, uh, so that you can keep track of how often people are actually opening your app to use it. Just as important, though, I would argue, is the app and game quit messages that you'll get, um, whether someone backgrounds it or um, force closes it. You're probably going to want to track these, too, um, because if you're your starts and your quits don't match up with one another, it can be a really good indicator that you're getting a lot of crashes and the game is not quitting appropriately. You know, people are experiencing some kind of bug in there that's, that's crashing the app. Um, device type, another really good thing to track. We tracked this through Google Analytics. I'm not sure um, what kind of information the other packages give you. I know Unity does it, but I don't think it gets as granular as Google Analytics did. 
Google Analytics would show you like by Android device type and phone type and all kinds of craziness. Um, this is fantastic to know from a testing perspective, like, okay, what are most of my customers using when I make an update? What should I be testing? Um, what other kinds of apps might they even be interested in? Um, but device type, I think, is a really important thing to track. With Block Blasters, we also tracked, six, tracked successes and failures. So on each level, we would track whether someone beat the level or failed the level. Um, and this gave us a really good idea of how far people were getting into the game, how many times they would retry a level before they gave up. Um, and that helped us really tune those things to see like, oh, all right, level 12 is like way harder than we thought. People are dropping off. Let's kind of tone that one back a little bit to help people kind of keep moving through the, moving through the game. Uh, and then purchases. If you have in-app purchases in your app or in your game, you can track those too. Um, I know that Unity Analytics allows you to set up funnels. So you can have a series of events that, that chain together, the last event being your purchase or whatever the goal is for them to hit. And it'll show you how far people actually get down your funnel. Oh, analytics are also cool um, because they give you information like this. And uh, apparently, I married a 50-year-old woman, which I didn't. But this chart tells me I did purely based on the fact that she's female and loves to play solitaire games. <laughs> and that's the only category that falls in. Um, this information is from Flurry. Uh, so you can kind of get an idea of the sorts of things that they're tracking. And this, again, is aggregated across multiple Flurry applications. And they're just kind of seeing what genres fall into different categories. Um, I found it interesting. And, and uh, I obviously had to share it with her that she's a 50-year-old woman. <laughs> um, so testing. And this kind, of, this kind of goes back into the analytics a little bit here. Um, but for testing, it's really important. It's really important to get your app in front of people as early as possible. Um, things are going to come to light that you didn't anticipate, that you didn't expect. Um, one of the things we had with Block Blasters when we first gave it to people and had them test it was that they wanted to tap like on the blocks. And th the idea is that you want to tap next to the block so that when the, the bomb explodes, it's pushing it in a certain direction. But people wanted to tap on the blocks. And our original code had it set up so that you know, when they did this, it was really unpredictable like how it was actually going to respond. Sometimes it would fly off in random directions and stuff. So knowing that they're trying to do this, we could adjust that in the game and make it actually behave differently when they did this. So kind of conveyed uh, more of what, what we wanted to happen uh, when they did this. The other thing they would do is they tapped on the bombs at the bottom of the screen, uh, which we also didn't expect. We thought of it more as like a cue that's showing you what's coming up. And just watching some for the first time and tap those things down there and use up all their bombs tapping on the bombs uh, made us realize that we needed to change that mechanic too. Uh, so we made it so you can't even tap on those palms. Um, another thing you're going to want to do is test in person uh, at least once. So um, sending your app to a bunch of people uh, and having them test it and give you feedback, I mean, that can be great. But when you're watching someone actually sit down and use it and, and hear what they're saying about things, watching if they, they look confused, they're, you know, they're wrinkling their eyebrow, they don't know what they're doing, um, that sort of feedback you can't really get any other way. Uh, and so watching someone use uh, your app or your game is probably going to blow your mind like the first few times you do it because you just you see them using it in ways that you totally didn't even anticipate. Uh, as far as how to facilitate testing, um, Android has this like hands down in my opinion. Uh, it's really easy. You get the people that you want to test your app to put their phones into developer mode and you can basically send them the APK file, the application, they can install it and, and do all their testing right there. It's awesome. Um, iOS uh, was a total bear. Like Originally, when they first released um, iOS and iPhones, the only way you could really test things was to actually physically get somebody's phone, find out their device ID, like provision it, add it to your account as a trusted device, tether it to your computer, move your app over to it, and then boom, there you go. Now you can run my app. Um, since then, they've improved it a little bit. Uh, there was this application called Test Flight, which used to be its own thing. Uh, Apple has since then purchased them um, and in some ways ruined it. It used to be really slick the way it worked, and it allowed you to deploy uh, to iOS and Android and all kinds of stuff all in one spot. Now, obviously, since Apple purchased it, it's iOS only. 
Um, so you're still faced with this inability to test both platforms at the same time with one tool. Uh, and the way that you still have to you know, get your app out to people and provision their devices and collect their device IDs is still kind of a pain in the neck. I'm hoping they, they kind of fix that a little bit. Uh, and then finally, analytics um, on feedback. So when we sent our app out for testing, um, we probably sent it to maybe 20, 20 or 30 of our really close friends and family members uh, and let them play it for a couple weeks. And then we sent them a survey to get some feedback about it, whether they liked it, if, where they got stuck, how much they would be willing to pay for it, uh, and got back very few responses, very, very few. I was really surprised, especially because it was friends and family. I was like, come on, guys. Uh, fortunately, though, we had analytics in the app, so we could collect all that information that they weren't telling us, and we could see where they were getting stuck. Um, some of it we wouldn't have access to, like what they'd be willing to pay for it and whatnot. Um, but it was much better than sending it out and getting hardly any information back from them. So if you are going to send your app out for testing, I would highly suggest getting your analytics package set up ahead of that date. Um, so that you can really start collecting that information uh, even when they're not providing it back themselves. All right, and publicity. Now, publicity was crazy for me. Um, my background in computer science and, you know, drawing, I knew nothing about marketing. I knew nothing about how to present this. I had this faint glimmer of a hope that when we released this app, it would make it to the front page of the App Store and magic would happen. Uh, but I kind of knew that wasn't going to happen uh, and would have to do a lot of legwork on my own. So I had a lot of questions. I really didn't know where to start with this. I didn't know what channels to use, who to target, you know, who the target audience for my game even was. It was really overwhelming. Um, and so I started tackling things um, one subject at a time. And the first thing I was wondering is, you know, how early do you start publicizing your game or your app uh, before you release it? Um, it seemed to me that, you know, I didn't want to start too early uh, because I didn't want to get this idea out there that someone else might steal and take my idea and build it faster than I could. Or, you know, maybe I get it out there and the one time someone see, happens to see a mention of my app and they're like, cool, I want to buy it. Oh, I can't. I'm done. I've already forgot it, right? So that's like, I, I was really hesitant to do that. Um, does anyone recognize this guy? Bill Fish, Bill Fish you got it. Um, so, Phil Fish, five-year development cycle for his, his huge game that he made. Um, and people were like at his throat the entire time about why was it taking so long, when's it going to be ready, sending him all kinds of nasty stuff, right? And this is exactly what I wanted to avoid. I didn't want to get into the situation. It sounded absolutely horrible. Uh, but the reality is he sold over a million copies in about a year. So he probably could have taken some abuse and been okay with it. <laughs> um, another channel to uh, consider using is going to be your social media channels. Um, Twitter is huge. Um, I started a, a G3Zer account on Twitter. I've got over 5,000 followers right now that we organically grew up from nothing. Um, and so I guess real quick, here's what I learned uh, with Twitter. And Twitter, Twitter was kind of crazy. Um, First of all, if you want to get started and you don't have a whole lot of followers, there's this hashtag IDRTG, um, and it stands for Indepe Independent Developer Retweet Group. Um, you can Google it. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, they have their own site. It's basically a group that you join, and you, when people have announcements that they want to make, they want to push their own apps, um, you can retweet their messages. And as you do this, you gain points from them. So then when it's your turn that you have your message, you're releasing your game and want to get it out there, uh, you've got all these points. And people will then retweet your message to earn points. And so this is a great way to attract random people on Twitter um, that will retweet your messages that you may or may not know. Um, so that's a neat feature of it. But it's also actually a really strong group. At least it was when I joined it. Um, and people are very friendly with one another. You know, you tag a message with this, and people would retweet it even if they weren't using the app to get the points for it. Um, they would just do it to be nice. They would reach out and be like, oh, cool, you're, you're an IDRTG member too. That's awesome. Um, it was a really friendly, friendly group of people. Uh, one other thing I did when I started Twitter was I was very aware of uh, not following too many people too soon and having like zero followers myself. 
because when people see that, it seems really spammy. Like, there's probably a reason no one's following this dude back. So you want to keep your ratio of um, people that you're following to people that are following you back at, a, at a, almost a one-to-one. -one. You don't want to get ahead of it too much um, just because people, before they follow you back, will look at that and decide that you don't seem like a, a good person to follow just because you seem kind of spammy. Um, so you're going to want to grow slowly. Um, and when you do this, uh, it's really great to engage the people that you're, that you're following um, and that are following you. So anytime somebody followed me, anytime someone favorited one of my posts or retweeted one of my things, I would always send them a personal message, like a public one, not a direct message. Public message on Twitter, thanking them for it. Um, eventually it got to the point where I had too many followers uh, joining me in a day that I, like, I couldn't send messages for all of them. Otherwise, it would be, it'd be insane. Like, people wouldn't even want to follow me because I'd be tweeting all the time about, thank you for following, thank you for following, thank you for following. So I started batching those. Um, and then I would do like one at the end of the day um, and just thank everybody all at once. Uh, and then I got to the point where I was doing two a day of that. So then I had to like stop doing that altogether. Um, but I think that I think that when you do that, and, and Twitter sees you following people, people following you, you mentioning the people that have recently followed you, it spurs them to put your Twitter account in those emails that they send out to people that say, hey, you should follow people like this, or you should follow these people, because they see you as being active in their community. Um, and I think I got a lot of followers through that. It's just people people finding me through um, Twitter, the Twitter outreach program. Um, you're going to want to be careful, too, about not tweeting too much. Uh, I was fortunate to have people following me that were really, really good with engagement. So whenever I would post something, almost immediately people would favorite it or retweet it or whatnot. Um, but I think that's because I didn't tweet too much. People definitely have a threshold that, like, if they have an account that's tweeting way too much, you're not going to be on their short list. You know, you're going to be in their like main news feed that they're not paying attention to. And at that point, it really doesn't do you any good because your messages aren't getting in front of them anyway, and they're not going to be engaging with your content either. Um, so you really want to be careful about that. And then the last thing I want to say about Twitter um, is that I would, um, I would recommend not using any sort of scheduled tweets or scheduled shares or anything like that. Uh, my engagement level was super high on Twitter until I started doing that. Um, and it just became overwhelming for me to like have to pay attention to Twitter all the time, every day, responding to people, when really what I wanted to do was work on my game and work on my app. So I set up this automated tweet thing, so like four times a day it would send out these things, and I didn't think that was too much. Um, but it really killed my engagement. I think people wised up to it. They, they realized I was tweeting at the same time every day, or um, just too regularly, and it just totally destroyed my engagement, um, which is a real bummer. And um, There's something else I was going to add, but if I think of it, I'll add it later. Um, Facebook, again, another um, social platform. Uh, this was fantastic for us. We made a G3Zer page. We got our stuff out there. We had people liking us. And then Facebook chose to introduce their um, business plans for businesses and where they could advertise. And that totally destroyed us. Like, our, our posts that we were making were getting buried in people's timelines. Nobody was seeing them. In order to get noticed, you basically had to pay Facebook to get your, um, your posts that you were making promoted so that they would actually show up in people's feeds. Uh, so that was a total bummer for us. Uh, the positive side, though, is with Facebook, you can still use their graph search, which is pretty awesome um, for identifying target, mar target market. So if you do decide to purchase ads through Facebook, you can look and see, OK, people who um, people who like, you know, uh, Cover Orange, which is like another puzzle game. I can target people who like Cover Orange as potential, potential people to send ads to who might like Block Blasters, because it's the same sort of concept. It's, it's a puzzle game, right? I'm not going to want to target people who um, like action games or like uh, casual games, because that's really not what it is. They're not going to enjoy that. So with their graph search, you can really easily whittle things down and see what other things people are interested in. That even helps you if you're, if you're running any kind of content marketing to know what to blog about, what to talk about, to help draw your audience's interest into you. Um, also for promotion, there's uh, pretty good independent developer communities out there. Um, SlideDB, IndieDB, and ModDB. They're all kind of the same thing. They're three separate sites, but when you publish content on one of them, it kind of um, gets moved through all three of them. Um, and we didn't really have great engagement with, with uh, any of these communities. Uh, we posted stuff out there. Um, 
some people would respond to it and, and stuff like that. We actually spent a lot of work trying to rank really high on mod DB since that has the highest traffic out of all, all three of them. And we got to a certain point where we, you know, we'd released a press release or an article or whatever, and we moved up to like number six in their list of most popular games, but we really didn't see any output from it. Um, so it, it wasn't, it was kind of a dud. Video sharing. Um, Obviously, the big one is YouTube. We also used Vimeo. Um, just found that in, in doing this, YouTube has way more people out there watching videos, people being curious about things. Uh, Vimeo, we've had pretty low engagement on the videos that we posted on there. Not a whole lot of views. I don't think there's a lot of people that just kind of browse it, like people that browse YouTube. Um, and YouTube might have better like recommended videos when you're watching one thing. They might recommend your stuff more often. We had much more success with, um, with YouTube than we did with Vimeo. Why? Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, sorry, she said that Vimeo is more for video professionals. Um, and it's true. I mean, if you go out there and you look at their content, it's a lot of like artsy, independent type films that people have shot and stuff like that. Um, my buddy Max, who's the visual effects guy, he posts a lot of videos out there, and he actually does really well with his stuff. But again, it's not like a trailer for a game. It's it's like he's doing something. Visual effects wise, he's building something in 3D. It's a time lapse video of him drawing something much more artsy than uh, just a game trailer. Um, another channel that we used with pretty good success was Reddit. Um, I'm not I'm not usually on Reddit that much, so uh, I kind of find it as it's a, like very fragile. I'm always afraid that when I post something out there, it's just going to get downvoted and buried like crazy, because I never really understand like what ends up making something go to the top versus get buried. Um, but the few times that we did post something on Reddit, people actually jumped on it pretty well. They received it pretty well. And they would almost always click through whatever link we were sharing. Um, and I have some stats on that later on. But we had some pretty good success with Reddit. Um, we also appeared on Indie Game Pod, uh, which is an independent game developer podcast. They interview um, app and game developers regularly. Uh, the guy that does this is fantastic. Uh, it was a it was a great time sitting there talking with him. And uh, even if you just start listening to the podcast to get ideas of what other people are doing, it's just a fantastic resource um, to sit and listen to. And we also had a blog, so we were really like reaching far here, right? We wanted to find out what's going to work. We were trying to just like throw everything at a wall and see what sticks. Um, and so we spent a lot of time writing some content for our blog. At first, it was tough to know what to share. Um, and then eventually, we kind of figured out, well, let's just post you know, code that we've written. Let's, let's talk about some of the things we've had to overcome. Um, at the time, Google Analytics and Unity didn't really play that well together. You kind of had to um, finagle some stuff to get it to work the way you'd want it to. Um, and so we had written some scripts and stuff to facilitate that uh, and posted that on our website, which ended up, we ended up doing really well on traffic on that article. Um, some quick SEO tips if you're interested in doing any kind of content marketing uh, is that you're going to want to you're going to want to target long tail keywords. So the longer the keyword search that you want to match on, the better. You're going to have less competition that way, um, and people naturally search that way too. They're they're not going to just type in um, something short and have any hope of finding what they're actually looking for. They're getting more and more specific with their searches, and so you should be more and more specific with the keywords that you're trying to target. Um, you're going to want to incorporate those things in some key spots in your page too. You can't just like throw a bunch of them, the keyword on there repeatedly. Um, you're going to want to get it in your page title and the closer to the front of your page title, the better. Um, and also in the URL. So WordPress by default uh, uses a unique ID when you post an article. Uh, if you go into your settings in WordPress, you can change this to be permalinks, which means that it's going to use your article title as the URL. Um, and that'll help give you a little bit of a bump in SEO also. Um, obviously, you keep it in the content that you're writing. There's like an optimal ratio. Um, and there's a plugin I'll talk about here in a second that helps you figure that out. Um, meta descriptions, Google doesn't really look at these much anymore, I think, because people kind of wised up to it and started abusing it. But there's some other search engines out there too. So um, it's a good idea just to make sure that your keywords appear in there as well. As far as plugins for WordPress, um, I found some that worked out really well um, and really allowed me to save some time and not have to spend all my time doing content marketing uh, and back, again, more time into the actual working on the game and, and the apps that I want to do. 
Um, there's a plugin called Contact Form 7 uh, that allows people to reach out to you um, through your blog really easily. And surprisingly, I, we do have a lot of people that contact us through our blog. It's mostly um, musicians. Interestingly enough, they reach out a lot of the times and say, hey, like, do you need any music for your games? Are you working on any games now? Like, here's my portfolio. I'd love if you check it out and incorporate any of our stuff. So um, that might be another strategy if you're looking for game music is to just get a, get a blog out there and put a contact form, and you'll probably get something back from a musician at some point. Uh, Google Analytics by Yoast is just an easy way of tying uh, your Google Analytics into your blog. Google XML sitemap. So Google generates a sitemap every time they crawl your website. Uh, it's called sitemap.xml usually. And it just helps them know which pages to check when they come back again later. Uh, if you do this uh, for them, there's a place you can go and, and provide this XML file to Google and tell them, here's where I'm going to keep it. Uh, it actually helps their crawlers, and they'll crawl your site more regularly because you're providing that information to them, and they're not having to spend the computing power to go do it on their own. Um, Jetpack is another good one. So this is kind of a core WordPress plugin. It's more of a collection of plugins now, really. Um, but there's some really great functionality just in the core Jetpack stuff that you can pick up. Um, we used MailPoet for our newsletters that we sent out. Um, you could probably also use like MailChimp or Aweber or something like that. Um, but we wanted to make sure we were keeping our costs low, and we used um, this plugin for WordPress. It allowed us to send out you know, HTML formatted newsletters to a specific mailing list of our friends and family um, and whoever subscribed to our blog. Uh, and would also track how many people opened those and also took action by clicking whatever CTA we had inside of those emails. So that was useful. Um, and WordPress SEO. So this is the plugin I was talking about on the previous slide where this will actually, once you've finished writing your post, this will give you a score on how well your SEO ranks for whatever keyword you're attacking. Um, and it'll show you, okay, you need to add it here, you should do it here. You have inc not included it too many times in your content. You need you need to include it less in your content, too, if you have it in there too much. Um, it also shows a reading score, which is kind of handy if you want to know how easy your article um, is for people to read. Uh, that gets kind of crazy when you are posting code, because it's, it's like it's, it's not readable at all. But uh, you already kind of know that. Um, all right, so with promotions, what, what to share, right? So we talked about using Twitter and Facebook and all this kind of stuff. Like, but what kind of content should you be putting out there? And we found the ones that got the best engagement were when we tweeted just quick little tips and tricks, things that we learned. Like if we're doing something in Unity and there's like a little gotcha, if we just tweeted about that real quick, people would kind of be all over that. They really like that. Um, questions for other developers. So like reaching out to other people um, who you see on Twitter posting other things. If you want to ask them a specific question about what they're doing, oftentimes when we would do that, it would spawn these crazy huge conversations that people would join into and, and all engage with. And it was pretty fantastic. There's also this notion of Screenshot Saturday, um, where on Saturdays, people just post screenshots of whatever they're working on. Um, and it's a fantastic way of getting your stuff out there. Uh, letting people see what you're doing, seeing what other people are doing. Um, it's a good opportunity to retweet those people who might always be retweeting you, but you don't ever have a good opportunity to retweet them. Um, videos. Videos are big. People like watching videos of stuff that you're working on. Maybe you just got a new feature done, um, and you want to take a like quick six-second video of that and show that to people. Um, and time-lapse videos. For whatever reason, when, whenever we recorded a time-lapse video of you know, me doing something in Photoshop or coding something and the feature working after the fact, we got really good engagement on those. I guess people just like watching fast videos for some reason. Um, so that's what you post. How do you know it's working? How do you know people are listening? Right? How do you know you're not wasting your time? Uh, Bitly is a great way of, of tracking these sorts of things. So every link that you post to anything, we would always wrap it in um, a Bitly link. And it's a really easy way you can go back and check your stats on that and see how many people actually uh, viewed it, how many people clicked it, uh, where those people were in the world and stuff like that. It's kind of neat to see sometimes when you get international people looking at stuff. Um, makes you feel bigger. Uh, and then obviously there's always ads, right? So if you do have money to spend and you want to promote your stuff, um, Ad agencies are spending more and more money um, in the mobile arena. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I'm seeing way more ads on my phone than I did before. Um, I actually kind of hope that someone makes a nice ad blocker for my iPhone. That'd be great. That's an app idea. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a good venue. The other thing, if you are doing ads, I would 
I would recommend that you target people on their mobile devices. So if you're doing a Facebook ad, you have this option. You can say when you're buying your ad, only present this to mobile devices. I don't want to show this on the website. Um, and that's, that'd be a great thing to do because when people are on their phones, they're far more likely to engage with mobile content on their phone than if they're on their desktop doing something. I'm just browsing my feed, right? I see a, a game ad over there. Probably not going to click it or be very interested in it. But if I'm on my mobile device, I'm already doing something. Well, cool. Now you've distracted me and I'm, I'm more willing to, to take action on that. Um, splurgy. Uh, another great thing to talk about. So one of the other guests on the Indie Game Dev podcast talked about Splurgy and talked about how they had fantastic success with this site. Um, and it's sort of an ad site, but it's kind of a social sharing site also. What they really did with Splurgy uh, is they held a competition. And so the, the prize of this competition was like a random person who was going to win an iTunes gift card. And I think they had like a $25 or $50 iTunes gift card. Uh, and basically, it was just they had this content they wanted to share, which was the fact that you can download um, or buy their app on the App Store. Uh, and for anybody who shared that content, whether it be uh, Facebook or Twitter or wherever, they got credit on Splurgy for doing that. And then the more times you shared it and the more places you shared it, the more credit you would get. So um, at the end of the day, they'd pick a winner from that pool of people and present them with the, with the iTunes gift card. And this ended up working out really well for them. They said they ended up doing this like four or five different times with different iTunes gift cards. Um, and it was, they were just overwhelmed with the number of people that they had engaging this and actually sharing this and trying to, to win these iTunes gift cards. So um, that would be a good thing to check into too if you're interested. And then there's cross-promotion. Uh, and this has kind of come up more recently, I think. Uh, this would be a really good option if you don't really have the money that you want to spend on ads or if you don't want to go buy a bunch of iTunes gift cards. Cross-promotion allows you to promote someone else's app from within your app. Uh, and I think you can get pretty targeted with these depending on which service you're using. Uh, so you could make sure you're targeting other strategy games, if that's what your, your game type is, um, or you're targeting other casual games. Um, and this is a way for you to earn credit every time uh, you show someone else's game to someone who's playing yours. And likewise, they'll earn credit when they show an ad for your game to anybody who happens to be using theirs or using their app. Again, with promotion, um, trailers. Uh, most people make an app trailer. We made one. Um, you really want to keep them short. That's like the biggest thing with the trailers. Uh, you can see here, like, engagement falls off like crazy. People just stop watching after it gets too long. Um, this, this graph is showing how many people, what percentage of people stopped watching in the first 2% of the video. So that's like, you're not even really getting in the video that far, and you've already got people dropping off of this thing. The longer you make it, the less attention you're going to hold from people. Um, quick and to the point is what you want to do. Um, and you want to also communicate the tone of your game in your trailer too. So gameplay footage is always really good, I think. Um, there's a lot of apps out there that'll use you know, more like cartoony type trailers that are fun to watch, but it doesn't really give you a good feel of what the game's actually like to play. Um, and that's, I don't think that's a, a great idea. Um, so if you are using YouTube, you, then you also have the ability to incorporate hotspots with your videos too so that people can click those things and take them right to the App Store. Um, right when they're ready to actually take action on this, you want to hit them with that call to action, that CDA. Make it really clear. Make it the only option on the screen instead of sending them to other videos or whatever at that point. Um, get them to engage right then, right when they want to, and give them one action to take, uh, which is going to lead them right to where you want them to be, which is likely at the App Store um, or Google Play Store. So what worked for us? All right, so. Um, this is how we tracked engagement with our application, um, stars earned. And this is a good way of telling <clears throat> not only um, how many people have downloaded, but who's playing it, right? So if people have downloaded it or whatever and they don't touch it, that doesn't do us any good. Really, We want people to keep playing this thing and keep engaging with it. So one of our metrics that we're tracking is how many stars they've earned as they're playing through the different levels. Um, and you can kind of see our curve there of where we released the app. Um, and then when we posted on Reddit, there was a pretty big bump there, too. Like, that was pretty successful. The podcast, I thought, would be um, a lot bigger for us than it actually was. 
Um, and then we even took the time to build out a PC version of the game and release that too. And thinking that maybe if people, you know, we released it, I think free on Indie City, if people played it on their PC and they were like, yeah, this is actually pretty cool. I'll pay a buck to play this on my phone. Um, but that <laughs> barely had any impact at all. Um, and then you can see right there, eight hours after we released our free version, it just it exploded. Uh, it kind of dwarfed the rest of our analytics. So if I include like the whole curve over there, I can't even read the rest of these spikes over here. They just get totally dwarfed. Um, this is the impact of the different um, referrers that we had on our web views. Right there at the top is Reddit. Um, and again, we really only engaged with Reddit maybe like two or three times. Uh, it wasn't that frequent. T.co is Twitter. Um, we post it on there regularly. Uh, and then the third one is the podcast that we appeared on. We actually had a pretty good number of people um, click through from the podcast page uh, onto our own, uh, our own website. And then lastly is press. And I mean, it's kind of the same thing as publicity, but um, it's a little separate too with how we treat it. This was another area where um, I had no experience with press releases. I didn't know where they came from. I didn't know who wrote them. I didn't know if they had to be written by a journalist or how this whole process worked. Um, if you guys are already familiar with these, then you've got a leg up on where I was when I started. Um, but what we found out is that people write their own press releases, and then they go ahead and just release them out there. And there's a few different channels you can use for doing this. Um, there's free and there's paid channels. And uh, wanting to save money, we just use the free ones. Uh, there's ones that you can pay for and provide your, your press release to them, and they'll blast it out to probably you know bigger audiences and more well-known ones. They also blast it out to the free ones for you, so you don't have to go to them and do that. Um, we didn't really get great mileage from our press release. Uh, we didn't get a whole lot of click-throughs or anything like that from any of the links in there. Again, we had tracking on all of these so we could tell how well these worked. Um, but I'm not sure if that's because uh, press releases don't work or if it's because you know, we just released to the free ones and all the app reviewers and people who actually care don't follow the free streams because they want to weed out the riffraff that don't want to pay for anything. Um, so I'm not really sure about that. Uh, we had a friend um, write our press release for us. Um, she's somebody that I worked with in Cleveland and um, she's, she's very good. She did this all the time as her, as her full-time job. And she did a good job of incorporating like kind of some creative things and some funny things in it. Um, she gave an overview of, you know, who we were, who Alex and I were, tried to catch the person's attention up front, talk, talked a little bit about the app and about the story of us and how we um, designed and developed this, and explained that what you really want to do when you're building a press release is um, give a bunch of content that is easy for whoever is going to cover this, whoever wants to take this and write about this, blog about this, whatever. Give them the content that they can copy and paste and just tweak it a little bit, and they, they can have their own article basically posted purely from all the information you gave them here. Um, and so then kind of along, along the same lines as press is reaching out to reviewers. Um, and this is really important. Uh, if you can get a reviewer, an app reviewer or a game reviewer on a blog, um, the bigger the blog, the better, uh, to review your game or your app, that's awesome. Right, but it's really hard to get this. It's it's really hard to find someone who's going to sit down and take the time to to cover what you've just built. Uh, so there's some things that can help you with this a little bit. Um, if you think about it, you put yourself in their shoes. You know, they're getting 20 to 50 emails a day. That's insane to have to go through those. There's a really good talk online by this journalist um, that was giving a talk at GDC, and I forget what year it was. Um, but he said that he gets 100 emails a day from people that want him to review their app and their game. And it's, it's impossible to spend any amount of time. If you honestly need to get through 100 emails a day, you barely have time to look at the subject lines. And so the average amount of time that they're spending is less than a minute on each email. Um, and I wouldn't be shocked if it was less than five seconds, given how much, how much communication they get from people. Um, so when you reach out, you want to do some things to help help yourself um, get noticed, right? So the first thing you're going to want to do is find the right people. I wouldn't blast an email out to just every single reviewer out there, right? If, if there's a reviewer who's writing reviews for um, you know, World War II strategy games, I'm not going to hit him up with my little note about block blasters because he's not going to take interest in that at all. 
So the first thing you really want to do is identify people who are writing reviews about similar content. And they tend to do this. And like they might have two or three genres they stick to, but you can definitely identify areas that people always write about. Um, and then how to reach out. So another thing, once you've identified what they typically write about, uh, I would read some of their articles and then butter them up a little bit, right? You wanna, everyone likes to be buttered up. So you wanna mention some of the other stuff that they've done and how you read this article and, and you really liked it or it got you into playing this game that you really enjoy now. Um, they're very receptive to that. Like it, it shows that not only are you reaching out to them, um, not only have you identified that they, this is a game that you think they would like based on the other things they've written about, um, but you're also acknowledging that you took the time to send them at least a custom paragraph, if not a whole custom letter, instead of just having a template where you change the name and fire it away to a bunch of different reviewers. You know, you're actually talking to them at that point. Um, and then when to reach out. So one of the things this guy talked about at GDC was that Monday mornings are like horrible for him. He just has a huge influx of emails that he has to go through. Um, Tuesdays, he's still trying to wade through some of the stuff that he couldn't get to Monday. Wednesday and Thursday start to quiet down for him a little bit. And then on Friday, he's kind of already zoned out and he's ready for the weekend. Um, so he said the best time to hit him and most other people is, is the Wednesday, Thursday range. And you might not even want to do it first thing in the morning where the, they're going through all their emails. You might want to hit them sometime midday or in the afternoon um, when you're going to be one of the fewer ones in their inbox that they might actually have a better chance of seeing at that point. And one of the things you're going to want to send them when you email them is a link to your press kit. Um, press kit is a great thing to have. It's essentially um, a link that will have screenshots of your app um, or your game. It's, it should have maybe a photo of you, your workspace, anything that you think tells a story, um, a video, the trailer, any kind, of, any kind of content that they can scrape and use in whatever review they might be writing about your app so that they don't have to do the work themselves and go you know, search the web and find images of your app or download it and take them themselves. Any kind of content you can provide them that they can just quickly and easily reuse um, is really fantastic. As far as the text, you're going to want to tell a story if you can. right? So maybe, um, maybe there's something that makes this, this special project for you or especially meaningful. If you can somehow get some kind of an angle in there or story in there, and think kind of ahead of them so that this is something that you're laying out. They can reuse this as a cool piece of their article that they're writing. It's going to make it that much more powerful. Um, and then lastly, promo codes. So if you are releasing a paid app um, on iOS, Apple provides you with a certain number of promo codes that you can use. Um, and these allow people to download and install your app for free. Um, the downside of this is that if somebody does use a promo code to install your app, they can't write a review in the App Store for your app. Um, and so it, would, it wouldn't be good to use these for, say, like family members and friends uh, to give them free copies of your app, because those are the people who, that might actually go take the time to write a review for you and give you a nice five-star rating there. Um, so save these promo codes. Use these for reviewers. You don't want to make a reviewer have to pay uh, on their own for your app. They're probably not going to do it. Um, and make sure you include your promo codes uh, in whatever communication you're sending um, off to them. And that's it. Kind of went through a whole lot of stuff. So, thank you. I know um, we had a lot of information tonight. We will be posting this online, the video, as well as your slides as well. Do you yeah, mind fine. sending yeah. that along? Some, okay. of the, some of the graphs might have been really hard to see from back there, so yeah. check them out if you're interested. Um, we'll take questions, and then while I'm doing questions, I'm going to hand out an evaluation. I'd appreciate if you could fill that out. It helps us with um, upcoming programs and figuring out our schedule. Thank you. Questions? Thanks. And real quick, too, I'd like to thank the Hudson Library for having me here tonight. It's been, it's been really cool. Um, it's a topic that I really enjoy talking about. It's been, it's been fun doing this. Go ahead. Um, as a programmer, do you think that the computer science uh, is really geared towards game development or someone who wants to be a game developer, like an indie game developer specifically, are they better off just kind of diving in and uh, themselves and just making games? Okay, so um, to repeat the question, it is, uh, do, I, do I think that the computer science degree is beneficial to someone who's interested in uh, creating games, or might they be better off just diving in on their own um, without going through school and getting that degree? Um, that's a good question. 
uh, I think that at least the computer science degree that I got at Purdue, I know like all schools aren't the same, but um, in my experience, uh, it in no way prepared me really for being a game developer. It's kind of completely different. Uh, the one thing that was that it really impressed upon me uh, was that it forces you, at least in my experience at Purdue, it forced me to uh, learn things. So the assignment wouldn't be, you know, go use this and do this. It would be, you know, go do this. And then you have to learn it on your own. You have to teach yourself this. Um, example, we had a project where we had to make like um, an interactive website to do something. They hadn't taught us anything about HTML or JavaScript or anything like that. So um, we'd have to go off on our own and figure all that stuff out if we didn't already know it. So that's one of the really great things that I picked up at Purdue was this ability to like identify the things that um, I, need, I knew I needed to learn and learn them on my own. So in that way, I would say that it did help prepare me in, uh, for game development. But as far as like the technical aspect of it um, and the actual programming and syntax, uh, you'd probably be better uh, just trying to run with it on your own. Uh, there's some great examples online. Stack Exchange usually has some really good stuff too if you're looking for really specific things you need help with. Um, you could probably pick up some books and stuff like that too or video tutorials. There's a lot of really good content out there that's geared towards a specific platform. And so if you're really looking to get into this and get started with things, um, you, you might be better off just picking up something like that, like a tutorial and starting there uh, and then filling in the gaps yourself. Anything else? Um, I'm getting into uh, web design mm -hmm. stuff. Um, is there a, it's pretty, is that a, is it going to be a bright future of that, in a chance that, and then like, am I, am I going to, it's pretty, isn't it pretty important to like learn that too, like web design and all that stuff? Or? So, um, so he says he's getting into web design and the question is, is that, is that should there be a bright future for that? Um, I hope so. <laughs> no, I really think there is. Um, and I think that one of the things that points to web, web apps always being around is the fact that you know, those persist. Those are always out there. You don't have to have those on your phone or your device to use them. If there's updates that need to be made to those, they can happen in real time, right? Like you don't have to rely on someone updating an app to get those updates. There's some things where it's just more convenient to have a web application to do these things. Uh, than a standalone application on either a desktop or on a phone um, or something like that. I think that field um, is almost always going to be out there. It's going to be changing, of course. You know, things are going to definitely change in that area. Um, but th there's, I think, very good arguments to be made that uh, you know, web apps are going to be around for a long time. Yeah. And in fact, you know, more and more of the stuff that I see, for example, JavaScript, right? Kind of the universal coding language for the web for any kind of interactivity you want to do. Um, that's getting used more and more in different areas too. If you're picking up Unity and you're familiar with JavaScript, you can already write a bunch of code in Unity um, and, and do a whole lot of stuff with that. So picking up web development and understanding the core concepts of that and how to write some things and accomplish some things with that, I think would help in, in a lot of regards in different areas too, not just um, on the web in the future. Yeah. Are there any resources or online classes that you can suggest? Um, yeah, so um, the question is, are there any good like online courses or tutorials that I would suggest for getting started with stuff? Um, that's a really toughie. Uh, my only experience really has been with the Unity side of things, right? So I could I can definitely say that Unity has their own tutorials that are really fantastic. They have a great set of video, tu video tutorials on their site that you can go through. Um, they're really easy to follow, uh, and they take you through some example stuff. In fact, they even have assets in their asset store um, that match up with those, so you can download the, the project, the solutions um, that they're working with in the videos and kind of go side by side with them. Um, as far as high level um, game design or anything like that, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have any good suggestions for that. Yeah. Udemy. Okay. Uh, they have both unpaid and paid classes that you can take um, that are geared towards game development. And even Lynda.com no, might have a little. Lynda but Udemy, Udemy is going to be more geared towards game development. Plural site for just general. Okay. Okay, so Udemy, um, Plural site, and Lynda.com. 
great suggestions. I've used uh, Linda for a while, and I enjoyed using that, but I hadn't looked at any of their game dev stuff. Linda's it's a good suggestion. Is, yeah, is it like 25, 25, 25 bucks, you get access to everything. This is a little different where it's just what you want to take. So, you know, the, the Corona classes mm -hmm. might be 10 bucks, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the Unity stuff might be 50 or 100, depending on um, another thing to look into with Linda, uh, if you are thinking about signing up with that, is they had a promotion going for a while where if you signed up with your LinkedIn account, you got like 21 days free. Um, and that's actually how I messed around with it. Um, you have to sign up with a credit card, but you can cancel before they actually charge you anything if you're interested and you don't want to keep them around. So LinkedIn bought Yeah, that's right. They did. Um, with the yeah, idea that's why. Yeah. <laughs> with the idea yeah. that as you the stuff on Linda, it'll update the resume. Yeah. Right away. Well, on the plural sites, well, 29 something, so 30 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. You can cancel at any time. Plural site. And that's. Um, S I G H T, I think, right? It's, it's just got um, it's lots of stuff. I'm in, in web development. Okay. Um, I use it because they're current on things. So if there's new ideas and new stuff going on, they have current things. Where some of the other sites I find are quite dated. And that's really important. Uh, if you get something that's dated, mm -hmm. don't don't waste your time. Mm -hmm. That especially holds true for like Corona. You you showed it up there. They had they changed to a totally new um, uh, graphics. Yeah. Graphics 2.0. And if you have a book or resources for graphics, oh uh, okay. Don't waste your time. Uh, yeah. With that conversation, how often do you have to go back and update your program? Um, it really depends. It depends on what you're doing in your program, and it depends on the, sp the specific things that your app may be trying to access or trying to do. Uh, Unity does a really good job of keeping their stuff up to date so that if you go into Unity and open an old project, it'll help you get everything back up to date, and you can just make a new build and get it out there. We released Block Blasters in um, December of 2012, and I'm still running it on my phone with zero version updates to it since then. Uh, so it's it's made it pretty well through everything um, since then. But again, I wouldn't expect that. Like that kind of surprises me that it actually still works <laughs> after it's been through everything. Um, it, your mileage is probably going to vary depending on what kind of functionality that you're trying to use and what things they're phasing in and phasing out and all that kind of stuff. Yes. I'm okay to ask this because I'm just really I I I was trying to um, enter a content. And I saw, like, oh my gosh, maybe I could do this. So I ended up trying to learn about development tools. And then, of course, the contest was over by the time I <laughs> But <laughs> I didn't see anything in there about any, like, Adobe stuff. Mm -hmm. like, all that graphic design. Yeah. All the, do, you, do you use all of that with this or without? I do. Um, I do use Photoshop. Um, I used it for all of our game assets and everything that we did. Um, for the little guys, I hand draw those. I hand drew those with like a Wacom tablet and stuff like that. But again, that's just because that's what I'm comfortable with and that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, the Adobe Suite, even with you know the Creative Cloud option of, of buying Photoshop for like I think it's twenty dollars a month or something like that. I mean that still gets kind of pricey. And so there's other options out there. Um, if you're graphic minded and you're really comfortable with the Adobe Suite, I'd say yeah, run with that and definitely use that. Uh huh. Yeah. I so it depends. It yeah, it really depends what you want to do with it, right? Like, um, Illustrator is great for uh, like vector art and stuff like that. If you're building an application um, or a game, you probably don't need to mess with that. You can probably just do pretty much everything you want to do in Photoshop and focus on that uh, and and learning that one. That's, it's got a steep learning curve. Um, so I would try and find as detailed of tutorials as you can, right, to like find the specific things you're trying to do with it um, and have, have it walk you through that. I mean, I've been using the Adobe products for, oh gosh, I don't know, 15 years now maybe, and every, I'll still see tutorials online that are showing me new like shortcuts and stuff like that that I didn't even know existed. So it's, it's, it's a crazy learning curve, but it's really powerful. So just one more thing, the 2D, mm -hmm. like, or more like your little girl's little activity. Yeah. That would be like a 2D with that. That would be, so would that be with 
you could use do Photoshop like design mm -hmm. things through that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So yeah, with the cutout kind of look and feel, yeah. um, I did I did that in Photoshop also. Um, and the shadows that you see there are actually part of the image. I didn't use any kind of like lighting or anything like that in my scene in 3D to create those shadows. I thought it'd be easier um, and probably m more consistent to just put a shadow on the object in Photoshop before I sliced it up and exported it. But yeah, that was all in Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first question, um, what kind of cut do Google and Apple take um, out of apps that you sell in their stores? I know Apple is 70%. You developer gets 70, Apple gets 30. Um, I'm not sure about Google, but I think it's something similar. Does anyone know what Google's is? Google Maps. Okay. As as okay. But with the ads and stuff, or like you getting purchases, I don't know about yeah, if you're running ads, right, that's a whole separate thing. You're going to have to deal with whoever your ad supplier is. Ad Mob's a really popular one. Um, there's some other ones too, but yeah, in Mobi, um, that's going to be different. Your cut on the ads is going to be different, um, and that's going to depend on your provider. Um, but as far as Google and um, and Apple, it sounds like they both take 30%. And that would be across the board. So regardless of you know what your price point is in different countries, because they both let you control that, um, or regardless of what your in-app purchase costs are and stuff like that, it's always like a fixed 30% uh, to them. So again, like if kind of talked about promo codes a little bit and now using those, if you do want to gift something or give something to friends and family, I always buy it myself in the App Store. Um, and then uh, send them the gift, because you can gift things through the App Store. So that way it's free to them still, and it only costs me like 30 cents. Um, and then the second question was? OK. OK, for the analytics or with SEO? Um, SEO mostly. OK, so um, how, did, how did I learn about SEO stuff? Um, Man, it's been such a long process with that. I think, I think I really started with that plugin on WordPress. Um, Google is constantly changing how their search algorithm works and how what what helps things rank better than other things. Um, and so I didn't really get into like getting any kind of books or watching any videos or anything like that because um, I didn't really want to have to spend a whole lot of time learning that stuff. Uh, I started with the plugin for WordPress because it was easy uh, and because it kind of spelled everything out for me. Right? And then as I started using that, you kind of start to notice patterns. Um, you also notice when they update the plugin, the changes that they're making to it. So like the frequencies and stuff might change of what they're suggesting. Or maybe there's another thing that now they're suggesting you do that they didn't suggest before. So I just guess I kind of noticed that stuff as those things kind of changed. Um, I also um, have a friend who's in marketing. Um, and we would just chat a lot about all kinds of marketing stuff, mainly game related stuff that I was curious about. So I kind of picked his brain about a bunch of things. But um, I, yeah, there wasn't like a real good resource for that that I went to. I just kind of picked it up as I went along. Yeah, yeah. And SEO, I mean, that's, a, that's like a whole topic in and of itself. That's a crazy world and it's always changing too. So it's tough to stay on top of exactly what's going on with that. I just wanted to have like high level, you know, 75% comprehension of what's going on. I didn't really care about the details too much. Yes? Have you had any issues with uh, like IP rights if you're someone ripping you off? Having any of your trademarks stealing in your, your original assets or anything? I haven't had, so the, yeah, the question was about um, IP rights and has anyone like ripped off our stuff or anything like that? Um, haven't had any issues with that, but I like nobody's copied our game assets or like made a spin-off game or something like that. Um, somebody did release a game shortly afterwards called like Block Blaster, um, which was it was kind of it's still a puzzle game, but it was a little bit different. Um, it wasn't like they were really trying to copy us. I think they just used that name for whatever reason. Um, 
thing we have had a problem with is um, pirated Android copies of our game. Um, and I don't, to my knowledge, I don't think there's any way of preventing that. You know, once, once people can get their hands on the APK, which is that application file that has everything in it, whether they've paid for it or not, like they have the file and they can distribute it to whoever wants it. So there's, there's a whole bunch of sites out there that um, would, would show up in my Google feed. I guess something I didn't mention in the talk, but might be good to know, is um, you can set up Google Alerts. And so we did that for Block Blasters. Uh, and any time it would pop up then, I'd get all these links to like pirated sites in Russia and stuff that are hosting our game for free, which is kind of a bummer. But <laughs> hope that they just people play it and use the social links in it. I don't know. <laughs> Anything else? Cool. Um, my email was on the first slide, but if you guys um, want to reach out to me, uh, it is gehardy, H-A-R-D-Y, uh, at gmail.com. Happy to chat with anyone. And then um, my Twitter handle is g same as the company name. So thanks. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>